What's up YouTube family? On today's video, I want us to talk about the white rage in the US and there is no a better person to talk about this topic than the professor Carol Anderson who tries to uncover the secret as to why there is a lot of racial divide in the US today. Let us watch this video guys. It is so wonderful having you here today. It is wonderful being honored with the John F. Morgan Senior Distinguished Faculty Lecturer, and it is wonderful to be at Emory. I wanted to talk about white rage, and I know it sounds crazy, but let me talk about how a black woman got to white rage. <laughs> <laughs> and although it looks like it began with Ferguson, actually it began in February 1999 when a black man came home from a hard day's work. And he went home, got into his apartment, and realized there was no food. You know that when you come home, you worked hard, you look in the refrigerator, and the refrigerator's looking back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that moment where he's just, and he's like, oh, but he's in New York. And you know New York, the city that never sleeps. So you know there's gonna be food available. So he goes outside, he steps on his apartment, you know, the, the porch, and whew, a car ro rolls up. Four officers of the NYPD hop out, guns drawn. 41 bullets later, Amadou Diallo goes down. 19 of those bullets hit. Amadou Diallo was unarmed. He had committed no crime. There was no warrant out for his arrest. He was just a black man in the Bronx. Now, that is bad enough. But then I'm watching Ted Koppel's Nightline and Mayor Rudy Giuliani is on. And Giuliani is just unrepentant. And Ted Koppel, as you know, is not a softball interviewer. And he is on Giuliani. He's like, Amadou, Amadou, Amadou. And Rudy's like, what? He barely says the man's name. What he does say, my policies are working. New York City is safer now than it has been in years. And he pulls out his little flip charts with the little graph showing crime going down. My policies are working. New York City is safer. And I'm thinking, it's not safer for Amadou. Safer for whom? And the policies that he's talking about it's the broken windows policing policy. That broken windows policing policy basically hyper polices black and brown neighborhoods, criminalizing black people, criminalizing brown people. You jaywalk, the cops are on you. Drop some litter on the ground, cops are on you. You're standing, cops are on you. You're walking, cops are on you. You are getting ready to step off the curve. Cops are on you. That hyper policing is the policy that Mayor Rudy Giuliani said was working. And while he talked about it, he said, and my police force is the most restrained and best behaved in the United States. I'm in Kafka land right now. <laughs> you know where, where Gregor Sampson is this big cockroach, but everybody's acting like it's normal, right? <laughs> you know, because I'm thinking most restrained and best behaved don't fire 41 bullets at an unarmed man. I know something is wrong, but I don't know how to name it. And you know, we have to name things in order to be able to face them, to be able to deal with them. And so I don't know what to call this thing. And I'm just going, Ugh. but as a scholar, I keep writing, I keep researching, I keep thinking, I keep teaching, I keep writing, I keep researching, I keep thinking. And then in August, 2014, I'm at, in my home office 
and the TV is on. And I look up, who and Ferguson is on fire. I mean, the flames are everywhere. And it didn't matter. I had the remote in my hand and I'm flipping the channels and it didn't matter. Let me see my left hand. It didn't matter if I'm MSNB, watching MSNBC. Yeah. CNN or Fox. <laughs> Out this door. Um, <laughs> it didn't matter. And it all said the same thing. Look at black folks burning up where they live. Did you know that black people were burning up where they lived? Black folks are burning up where they live. What is wrong with black people? Burning up where they, who burns up where they live? Because one of the things you begin to understand is that America needs the narrative of black pathology. You know, everything would be fine if only black folks would. Right? We've heard this. And then you begin to fill in the blank. If only they would value education. If only they would not be thugs. If only they would. You fill in the blank in terms of that black pathology because that is absolutely necessary in the narrative of America. And so there I'm watching MSNBC, CNN and Fox all with the same narrative of black pathology. This black rage they're talking about. Well, I'm sitting up there and I'm shaking my head. You know how you're shaking your head like, mm mm, mm mm. And then I realized I'm looking shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. I'm shaking my head so hard. And I said, no, this is white rage. Ooh. Ooh. This is white rage. Family, according to your experiences, according to the knowledge you have, or rather what you've had from people, what is white rage? according to what I have gotten from our professor right here, is that white rage has always been a constant figure in the U.S. Anytime black people are trying to fight for what is rightfully theirs, then now the, the white folks just start pulling them down and trying to act like the black folks are the problem. That's why the incident of our brother who arrived home late got nothing in his fridge, decided to go outside on a stroll to look for food in the busy streets of New York, was shot multiple times. Do you know why he was shot? He was unarmed. Do you know why he was shot? It is because he's black. You know, the system has always been against black folks in America. And you tend to wonder, why are white people in America having a lot of rage? That's what exactly the professor is trying to explain to us today. Why the white people have a lot of rage. And guys, the white rage, um, just like Anderson explores how every significant gain by African Americans from the end of civil war through the civil rights movement to the election of the first black president has been met with calculated and um, persistent opposition by those in power. This opposition often takes the form of laws and policies that appear neutral but are designed to erode the rights and achievements of black people. This um, lady wrote a book and um, the main message in the book of the white rage explains that um, the key historical moments such as introduction of black codes post civil war the resistance to the brown v-board of education decision and the southern strategy following the civil rights act anderson work is a powerful examination of how structural racism and white resi resentment have shaped american history making it vital to the contribution of the race and equality in the united states you know any time a black person wants to do um, or rather wants to just make themselves feel like the citizens of america there is always an issue that's when we are attacked as a people that's when it is not okay for a black person to drive in the u.s you know it is not okay for a black person to walk in um, 
um, areas that are deemed to be of rich people. You know, they believe that there is nothing good that can come from black men. And why is this family? Because, yo, it is not fair. Why is there a lot of rage by white folks in the USA? White supremacy has always been an issue since the days of slavery. You know, and um, it is time for black folks to come together and say no to this disease. It is time that professors uh, just try and educate white folks. It is time that white families in the U.S. get to educate their children in regards to matters of the human race. Because I do believe that there is only um, one thing when it comes to human beings. It is that we are all equal. All these other um, stories are just null and void. Let us continue listening to the professor in regards to white rage. I had lived in Missouri for 13 years. I saw the way that policy worked. I saw the way that policy systematically and systemically undermined African Americans' access to their citizenship rights. But as a nation, we were so focused in on the flames that we missed the kindling. That kindling. Let's talk about some of that kindling at Ferguson. Kindling. 67% of Ferguson's population is African American. In the 2013 municipal election, the black voter turnout rate was 6%. How do you turn 67% of the population into 6% of the voters? Those are numbers from Jim Crow, Alabama. You do it via a series of policies, the ways that you hold your elections, the ways that you craft your ballots. There's a whole series of tricks that you can use to change 67% into 6 kindling because you begin to think about what it means if you don't believe that you even have a say in who your representatives are kindling let's talk about the schools michael brown school system missouri rates its school systems it, it accredits them on, on a 140 point scale graduation rates uh, matriculation rates test scores, the whole nine yards, and you can get a total of 140 points. How many points do you think Michael Brown school system got? How many? On 140. Hey, 20. 20. That's a good one, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. 20 out of 140, right? Anybody else? Ten. Ten. Whoa. Read the book. Aren't <laughs> okay, I believe that's called cheating. <laughs> Ten. Ten out of 140 points for 15 years. What that means then is that the public policy leadership was very comfortable with pulling an entire generation of black children through a school system that could garner no more than 10 points, an entire generation, and then start pulling another generation through because we're at 15 points from K through 12. Kindling. Kindling, let's talk about the police. We know that the police are here to protect and serve. Protect and serve. Yeah, because I'm going to be doing this throughout because there's a kind of hymn book that we sing from, right? <laughs> <laughs> we know, right? We know the police are here to protect and serve. So in this protect and serve, except in Ferguson, they looked at that black population as revenue generators. So. You're doing 26 and a 25, boom, ticket. Hmm, I don't think you fully stopped at that stop sign. Boom, ticket. Ah, looks like you've got a broken tail light. Boom, ticket. 
And this is a working class neighborhood. And so when you start hitting this neighborhood, this community with $50 tickets, $25 tickets, $80 tickets, $100 tickets, and you begin to think about what that means, you pay the ticket or you pay your rent. You pay the ticket or you keep food on the table. You keep the lights on. There's not disposable income here. When you don't pay that ticket, the next time you're doing 26 and a 25, because now there's a warrant out for your arrest, then you are jailed. And then the entire criminal justice process of fines and court fees and bail are all pulling from this working class black community. By the time when Ferguson blew, those fines and those tickets accounted for 25% of Ferguson's operating budget. 25%. And let me be really clear, justice was not blind. Justice, in fact, had, what did you call it? Had Lasix. Because <laughs> justice was, so if the police would happen to stop somebody white and try to hand them a ticket and go, ooh, ooh, sorry, sorry, not you. Or if the police officer handed somebody white a ticket and somebody white went in to go then pay the ticket, it was like, what are you doing? I'm trying to pay this ticket and to tear up the ticket. So you're getting this massive extraction from the working class black population in Ferguson. Kindling. And so as I began to think about this kindling, I began to think about the way that white rage worked. White rage is not about visible violence. We often think of rage as visible. We often think of the racism as this visible thing. But white rage is subtle. It is corrosive. It operates through the state legislatures, through Congress, through the judiciary, through school boards. It cloaks itself in legalities. And so I set out, and so because it's so quiet, it's so subtle, you don't see it. And so I set out to blow graphite onto that fingerprint to be able to trace white rage throughout time, not all the way back to time immemorial with the dinosaurs, <laughs> but at least up to the Civil War all the way through to 2016. And one of the things that became clear to me as I started thinking through how white rage works, is it became clear to me that the presence of black people was not the trigger for white rage. There's that stun, almost what you talking about Willis, look. <laughs> it is the presence of black people with ambition. The presence of black people with drive the presence of black people with aspirations, the presence of black people who achieve. It's the presence of black people who refuse to accept their subjugation, the presence of black people who demand their rights. That's the trigger for white rage. There's something that I loved right there, the trigger row of white rage, you know, white rage only began after black people started knowing what is rightful theirs after black people started succeeding you know after black people started knowing what the law asks of every american citizen after black people started be just started being su successful in the u.s that was a trigger of white rage that just made the white supremacists feel like, yo, these people are starting to defeat us in our own land, as they put it. White rage has always been fear for black excellency. Like, the white people in the U.S., especially the white supremacists, the white people who do believe that black people do not deserve good opportunities in the U.S., are always acting with a lot of rage towards us. 
because they are afraid of us. Let us look at what is happening right now in the UK, where white people who are born in the UK took onto the streets just to complain and say, yo, the black folks who are immigrants in our country have started taking our opportunities, you know. But these people have worked to achieve those opportunities. They are actually employed on basis of merit, you know. But now the white folks right there just feel like, yo, no, they are taking our opportunities. But no, that's not the case. The case is that these people are trained. These people studied. They have their degrees, they have their masters, and they qualify to get these jobs, you know. This has always been the fear of a white man. The white man in the U.S. believes that the black folks will always be their slaves. And these, these things are changing right now. Black folks are starting to get better opportunities in these countries. We saw what happened in the U.S. Obama won the election two times. These... Um, was an issue that did not um, impress the, the white supremacists who do believe that there is nothing good that can come of, of a black person. The fear of black excellence is the cause of white rage in the U.S. Let us talk about the issue of the tickets that um, the professor has tried to explain. When a black guy passes with their car and stops slowly, at a stop sign, the traffic, they are told, no, you, you did not stop fully. They are given out a ticket that they should pay. You know, they, 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 they drive with um, a little uh, issue in their car. It could be that the lights are a little bit off another ticket. You know, they, they are always there looking for problems for black folks. Can you, can you be able to afford driving this Lamborghini? Is it yours? Can, we, can you ascertain that it is yours? These are problems that the black folks are getting in the U.S. We are going outside to vote in an area where it's predominantly black in our state. Then they say that only 6% of us voted. And we know good well that in this state, 67% of us are black folks. You know, you wonder, how are all these things happening? The white man in the U.S. has always had a goal to suppress the black folks because they do believe that these people are a threat. We've seen time and again, time without number, when a black guy sits next to a white person on a plane in the U.S. or rather in a, in a bus, they stand up and go because they do believe that there's nothing good that can come from these people. They do believe and tell their children that black folks are thieves. There is nothing good from those guys. That is the white rage. The threat. They feel threatened that right, right now black folks are enlightened. Right now black folks are starting to become successful. Right now black folks are fighting for what is rightfully theirs. And that's the fear of a white supremacist in the U.S. Let us continue listening to our professor right here in this society has therefore punished black resilience and black resolve. Now, at this point, this sounds like I'm a Scooby-Doo-ish, right? Because we know it's so counterintuitive because we think of the US, America, as the land of opportunity, right? And so all you've got to do is Work hard. Work hard, yes. And Pull up. I'm telling you, y'all know the hymn, <laughs> right? So, so my baritone's here. <laughs> we know the hymn. We don't even have to pull out the book. It is in the ether. It's in the cultural language that we understand how this nation works. But so what happens if you have a series of policies that in fact punish black achievement, black aspiration? And it sounds counterintuitive, but how else can you explain how government after government after government has worked so hard to see to it that black children do not get a quality <laughs> education? Let me give you a couple of examples. In 1947, in Prince Edward County, Virginia, The school board finally agreed to build 
a high school for the black children. Because remember, this is a completely segregated system. Jim Crow. And so in 47, that would be after the U.S. helped defeat the Nazis. I need to put that in its time frame. Then we get a high school for black children in Prince Edward County. Within a few years, that school is bursting at the seams. Two to three times as many children are in this space than that building can hold. And so the black parents are going to the school board, the all white school board saying, we need an additional school. We've got kids bursting at the seam. It's doggone near impossible for them to learn sitting one on top of the other like that. We need a new building. The school board was like, no. And the parents are pushing hard, unrelenting, demanding education for their children. And the school board finally relented and put up three tar paper shacks and said, your kids can go there. Now, meanwhile, the white school is nice brick with indoor plumbing, which is not available in the black high school. In 19, by this time, we're in 1951. So there was a, a, a young woman, Barbara John, 17. And Barbara John's was like, my name is the wrong one. <laughs> you gonna take this. You gonna take this. No, you're not taking this. You gonna take this. Yeah, you're like, no, we're gonna walk on out of here, aren't we? And she starts organizing that school for a massive walkout, a massive demonstration, saying, we're not having this. We're not having it. They rose up and boom, hit the door. Administrators were like, what, what just happened here? And they were like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now it was, she wasn't playing. And so the death threats started coming in on this 17 year old child who was demanding quality education. It was so bad that her parents had to spirit her away to safety, to Alabama. <laughs> Boom, I rest my case. <laughs> you know when you got to go to Alabama for safety in 1951, <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Prince Edward County becomes one of the school districts that's bundled into the Brown case. Now, when Brown came down, Prince Edward County said, oh, I got something real for you. And so what the town fathers working with the state legislature decided to do was to shut down the entire public school system. Because that way, if we've got to have equal schools, then black children and white children equally do not have access to a public school. <laughs> and you can almost hear the aren't I smart <laughs> written on them. Except, you know, so black parents are like, what? But they're not listening to black parents. White parents are like, what? And they're like, oh, no, 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 we got this. You know we're not going to let your white babies go, you know, go uneducated. You know that. And so what they have done is that they have set up taxpayer funded vouchers to pay for the tuition for white children to go to all white segregated private academies. So white children continue to be educated and there is absolutely nothing for black children thousands upon thousands of black children. The system in the US of A really tried to bring about ways that black folks will continue to be um, just um, unmotivated in all ways. You know, they're trying really, really hard to fight a black man who is eyeing success. We all know that the schools are the key to a good life in future for the kids, but down in history in the US, they really, really tried hard to make black children not to be able to gain knowledge that they require that would make them beat white folks in the job market. You know, it is sad.
that they did this systematically just to suppress us as a people as black folks because they once again do not believe that there is something good that can come from us they feel threatened family this was an expose of the white rage by our professor right here i hope you enjoyed this video and i hope you do consider subscribing to my channel for amazing amazing black history videos it could be in africa and it could also be in the u.s or any diaspora so guys thank you so so much for watching this video can you do consider subscribing to this channel and guys i'd really appreciate if you also join to be a member and i'd be also grateful if you all supported me through super thanks so that we may be able to do more and more of these videos so guys thank you so so much comment down below and let me know what you think of this video goodbye for now